Thornton wanted to convey the dominance of the British Empire at the time, culturally and militarily. And his work is very much a reflection of that. Uh, during the time that he was creating this work, Britain was constantly at war back and forth, mostly with France. And so it's, it's more than just the botanical work, but he was very, very involved with, with, with the sense of, of British authority and its dominance on a worldwide level. So as these pictures are depicted, most often he is showing the various parts of the world that they are not only native to, but land upon which Britain had laid its imprint as well. And here we have the Egyptian water lily with the pyramids of Egypt in the background, which aptly displays what I was describing. The story of the production of the Temple of Flora is in part a sad one because it did end in failure for Thornton. And his objectives were never realized as a result of the publication of the work. He had no idea probably how famous he would be today, not as a result of the political and social statements that he was attempting to make, but because of the artwork that he created and how it is admired today. Now, interestingly, this wonderful picture of the roses, which many feel is among the best compositions and most masterly painted, is the only plate that was made from an original painting that was authored by Thornton. Now, there's no doubt that Thornton's aesthetic was the guidance by which all of these pictures were created. In fact, he did write directions to the artists about the nature of the landscape, the perspective that was to be used, the subject being brought to the foreground and the backgrounds being in the distance, even viewed from a slightly lower perspective by the viewer looking up toward the primary subject. So Thornton's direction is clear and in the results you see that all of these plates have a commonality from an aesthetic perspective that looks as though they were really created by one artist. So indeed, Thornton, no doubt, deserves the primary credit for that. But he is reportedly the artist of the roses. And everything that's been written about Thornton accepts that fact. Um, it's difficult <laughs> to, to understand or reconcile the idea that a man who is known to have really not created any other artwork, uh, just sat down and executed a painting that is virtually flawless and of this quality. And it's hard to understand that if he was an artist of this caliber, that he wouldn't have contributed more to the book. But that's just my own take on it. Uh, as far as we know, this painting was authored by Dr. Robert John Thornton. Next, we're going to look at a plate that stands alone, perhaps as the most dramatic and famous of all of Thornton's images, that of the night blowing Sirius. Now I have to emphasize it's the night blowing a Sirius because many people think that this is a typographical error or, or an, uh, an error of some kind because one would think it would be the night blooming Sirius since this flower does bloom at night and is well known for that. But this is 
verifiably the correct title of this plate, The Night Blowing Sirius, and you can see it in the text of the volume that we were just going through. Now, this image illustrates the complexity of Thornton's work and the extent that he would go to to create not only a dramatic image, but one of scientific accuracy. Now, in this case, the painting was executed by two different artists. One was Philip Renelgi, who painted many of the uh, flowers for Thornton and was a very prominent, well-recognized painter in Britain at the time. But because of this particular scene, he wanted to show this flower blooming in the middle of the night. And you have, even though this is a tropical flower, an English clock tower in the background. Could have been a clock, an English building that was built in one of their conquered areas, or it could just simply be a juxtaposition uh, that Thornton chose to make where he can illustrate not only the English architecture, but also in the bell tower you have, or the clock tower, I should say, you have the clock at three past midnight, which is when the flower bloomed. Now, of particular interest is the moon in the sky in the background. He hired an artist by the name of Pether in England to paint the moonlight for this picture. And Pether was particularly known not only for his ability to create a wonderful sense of moonlight, but also the accuracy of his work scientifically, because he would paint moonlight so that you knew exactly by the angle of the shadows cast when the moon at what time it was in the sky for that particular season and that particular day of the month. So we can assume based on the fact that he uh, contracted this artist to paint the, the, the sky and the moonlight that this is a, an accurate representation of exactly how the moon should have looked perhaps sometime around 1801 when he issued this plate, wherever this plate was supposed to, to, to be taken from, wherever in the world, whether it was South America or Great Britain, we don't know. Now, interestingly, there is not a lot known about Thornton's process, how he interacted with the artists and the efforts that he went through working with the printmakers, there's not a lot that's written about that. But you can, it, we know from the nature of the work itself that it was in, an incredibly complex undertaking. And again, this had to do perhaps with his sense of rivalry, rivalry with French botanical work and printmaking that was actually uh, the best at the time. So Thornton uh, included in the printing process virtually every engraving technique of the day. And oftentimes those techniques were in incorporated into one plate, two or three of them. There isn't a consistency. Some plates would be only stipple engraving. Some would combine, however, line engraving stipple engraving, and mezzotint engraving, and sometimes aquatint etching. All of the known copper plate techniques that were used. I can't think of another work by another artist that incorporates all of these printing techniques. So in part, it was certainly being done and did achieve a unique effect in terms of the appearance of the pictures like no others have. But also it may have been Thornton's idea of showing a tour de force of Britain's ability 
in printmaking, especially the incorporation of stipple engraving, which was invented in England. But as a young man, Pierre Joseph Retete went to England to study stipple engraving. He returned to France to perfect the technique and become the leader in the field as the best artist utilizing stipple engraving for his work. So that may have been a particular challenge to Thornton. Now, this compulsive sense of wanting to achieve a superior work botanically, scientifically, artistically, could well have led to Thornton's downfall because the works were so complex and so expensive to produce. But these things also combined with social elements of the day. Uh, interestingly, botany, which was the leader of science worldwide at the time with the center of it intellectually and academically being Great Britain, was beginning to lose its place a little bit in stature because the science of chemistry was beginning to, to, to captivate the primary interest of, of the aristocracy, of the academics, and even of royalty who were the greater, great supporters of these kinds of works. So perhaps there was a tendency for the botanical work to become slightly less popular, less support. Perhaps it was Thornton's uh, ambition and, and con consumption with creating a work like no other that, that led to the downfall. But ultimately, he did not uh, make enough money to support the cost of the pro project. And he spent his last year still publishing in the field of botany, uh, but in relative poverty. And as I mentioned earlier, perhaps not aware of the fact that he would be so well known today. We're going to end our tour today at the beginning of our exhibition. Now, Thornton's second volume, in addition to the portraits of the prominent botanical artists and the description of Linnaeus's scientific work and the wonderful illustrations of the dissections, is filled with reams of saccharine romantic poetry of the day of which there were many contributors to the work, as well as Thornton himself being the author of some of this uh, poetry. But the frontispieces also represent the Romantic period and the sense of idealization of the subject matter and its importance in, in, in the world. And we begin here, the titles are the most revealing in addition to the works themselves. This is Cupid inspiring the garden with love. Again, he, he is also referring to the description of the sexual system of the plants. And here we have Flora dispensing her favors on the earth. And we go on now to the ancient references of Asculpulus and Flora and Ceres and Cupid honoring the bust of Linnaeus, a wonderful juxtaposition <laughs> of time. And then again here we have Linnaeus in his Lapland dress and a portrait of Linnaeus. However, these are the colored versions that were in the Temple of Flora the, of the only the 32, 33 plates that were produced. Thank you for joining us on our tour today. We're happy to share our natural history collection with you, showing the most important works from the 17th through 19th centuries. Please like us on our YouTube channel, and we'll see you the next time.